those animals into groups and feed based on those requirements. We'll talk a lot more about body condition and why that's important. And Lisa kind of kicked this off last time, just talking about um, evaluating that condition and how important that is to you know, the production of that animal. Um, so we need to really consider you know, what shape your cows are in right now and what shape you want them in um, heading into the winter months. Obviously the timing of calving impacts that because it's going to dictate um, the nutrient requirements at different points throughout the feeding season. Um, so we'll talk more about that. And then of course, each operation will have access to different types of supplements um, and all these other considerations with the supplement costs, the labor required to um, feed, and then various types of equipment and things like that that are necessary. That's all gonna enter into the equation. And then uh, after my presentation, we'll talk more about the pasture management, but you know, oftentimes for livestock producers, the animal's gonna come first, which is expected and necessary. But we also have to consider, you know, the consequences of, of maybe long-term heavy grazing just um, on different negative aspects on our rangeland production, which Dr. Meehan and Dr. Sedevic will discuss. Okay, so there's a lot of lines on this graph, but it's really not all that complicated. It's basically just showing you the crude protein requirements on the left and the TDN or energy requirements on the right. And so it's based on months since calving. And so if we're looking out here at months 11 and 12, so that would be in late gestation, um, you can see that those requirements are gonna start to head up. So if we're in a typical spring calving um, operation, we're probably here around the eight or nine um, months. And so we're at mid gestation where the requirements are at their lowest. And this is a really good time to increase condition on those cows. But as you can see, then it will really start to increase heading into late gestation. And then if we get into that uh, months one or two, you can see that that's definitely the highest point of nutrient requirements in the production cycle. And you can also see how much that weight and milk production play a role here in requirements. And so looking at the bottom blue, dot, blue dotted line, that's a 1200 pound cow producing 20 pounds of milk at peak lactation. And that peak lactation will occur somewhere around 45 to 60 days after calving. If you look at the uh, blue line with the longer um, dashed lines, that is a 1200 pound cow at 30 pounds of peak milk. So adding 10 pounds of milk increases that crude protein requirement but from about two and three quarters up to nearly three and a half pounds of crude protein. So really can make a dramatic difference. And again, Lisa kind of mentioned, you know, make, making sure that your resources um, are able to support that milk production of those cows is really important. Looking over here at TDN on the right, it, it follows a similar pattern. You can see in the months going into uh, late gestation, the energy requirement is going to increase a little bit more than the protein requirement. And so we need to, to be paying attention to that. But again, um, those requirements are gonna be heading steadily up in late gestation and then maximizing around two months after calving. Okay, so body condition scoring. I know it oftentimes feel like, it feels like we beat this topic to death, but I really feel as much as we do talk about it, it's maybe not utilized as much as it could be in terms of um, actual records relating back to individual animals and then following those um, at different points throughout the production cycle to really relate back to what's happening um, you know, in terms of productivity. So it's basically just a really subjective way um, to evaluate the nutritional status of your cow herd. Um, it is based on a visual evaluation, um, maybe combined then with palpation, and particularly for those who are just learning how to body condition score, uh, it's really valuable to have that palpation combined with the visual evaluation, just to really get a feel for, for what you're looking for. Um, scale goes from one to nine. Um, I'll, talk, I'll show you guys a few examples of some more common body condition scores that you would um, that you would come across. We very seldom see a one or a nine, although those do off, they, they can show up. So essentially body condition score will affect, affect all these different factors here. So calf survival and health, and also subsequent reproductive performance. And in fact, body condition score at calving, is one of the most important factors related to reproductive performance that following year. 
So it's really a, a useful tool in helping us evaluate how successful our feeding programs are. And we can also use it to kind of sort and, and feed cows more strategically. And I, I am pretty sure that Lisa shared this slide with you or something like it last week as well. Um, this is a really nice resource out of the University of Wyoming, um, basically just kind of simplifying things into a three-step process. So we're going to look um, at the last two ribs. If they're easily visible, we're going to have a body condition score less than a five. If not, it's if we're not seeing any ribs, it's going to be greater than or equal to a five. Then we're looking at the spine. If we can see it, the body condition score is going to be less than a three. And then we're looking at the shape between the hooks and the pins. And I'll show you some examples here on the next slide. So this is a, a unfortunate cow that lived in New Mexico that was fed to achieve these various condition scores. And I like this because it is the same cow. So you can really see the changes as opposed to looking at cows in different body condition scores. Um, so you can really see here um, just how angular she is with the body condition score of three. You can see the a visible spine. And so a lot of times we think that body condition score is related only to um, fat cover. And it actually also has to do with lean muscle tissue. And so when cows start to become energy deficient um, or protein deficient, they can mobilize um, muscle tissue or fat tissue, depending on which nutrient is the most restricted. And so you can see cows actually start to um, mobilize muscle or protein deposits as well as fat stores. So you can see here that spine is very visible as she's losing muscle um, over that rib area and a very strong V shape in between the hooks and pins. Um, body condition score four, a little bit better, not as angular, starting to round out in the hind quarter. Um, we can see those two visible ribs though, but that shape between the hooks and pins is maybe not quite as angular. And then just going on into that body condition score five, that's our moderate condition. That's the one that we're targeting most of the time. Um, we're not gonna see those last two ribs, not gonna see a spine and everything's really, really rounded out and we don't see a lot of angularity in the hooks and pins. Same thing with the condition score six and increasing on up. Definitely not gonna see ribs or spine in those. So when can we use this? Uh, there's a lot of different times of the year that it can be valuable, um, just depending on, on how things are looking for, um, you know, your forage quality and your management options. So a late summer might be a good time to, um, you know, if, if conditions aren't looking good out on your rangeland or for forage production, think about some early weaning. Um, maybe cows are just drawn down a little bit. It's been a harder year. Um, that's an option. Then at weaning, um, obviously, if you think back to that requirements slide, we're going to be able to, we have some time so we can set those cows up to have, uh, to calve in a good condition. Um, and now depending on time of weaning, which I'll talk about here briefly um, in a minute, um, we could have that start of the third trimester occurring before we actually wean. And so just making sure, um, you know, if, if, we, if it's not at weaning time, then prior to or at that beginning of late gestation is another good time. And then at calving, actually recording the body condition score at calving. Um, if you're out there recording uh, other calving information anyway, make another column for a body condition score. And it's really interesting to, to look back um, at preg check time and try to kind of correlate some of those body condition scores at calving, um, maybe with some of the, the different reproductive issues we might see. So you guys are probably all familiar with this. This is our kind of our target, um, target body condition score five for our mature cows. Um, and again, Lisa showed some data um, for the, the cows in various condition scores. And there can be a little bit, you do get a little bit of extra boost if they start to get up over that six. But um, in most situations, you're going to be putting more into your feed resources than you're going to be getting out of the cows. So um, really just targeting that five. And in some situations, um, you know, such as that New Mexico environment or maybe another um, where, where nutrients maybe aren't as available, um, in some of our production situations, cows can become really efficient and can actually operate at a slightly lower body condition and still be reproductively efficient. And so it's really going to depend on your individual situation, but overall we kind of target that condition of five. And then six for those first calf heifers, just to give them 
a little bit more opportunity to recover after calving. Um, they have obviously huge requirements for lactation and they're also still growing. So that's just gonna give them a better chance to rebreed. So if we have evaluated our body condition score and we're thinking about um, trying to get to that moderate condition at calving, this is just an example of what you need to think of in terms of providing enough feed resources to reach a certain average daily gain. And so if those cows are less than a condition score four and we wanna hit a five at calving, so let's assume they're a three, in that last trimester of gestation, we're gonna get anywhere from 80 to about 100 pounds um, of weight in calf and fetal tissues. And so if we need to, and then each body condition score is approximately 80 pounds of weight. And so if they need to gain um, two body condition scores, we're looking at a 80 pounds of calf and 160 pounds of body weight. So they're gonna need to gain a total of 240 pounds. Um, if we're starting right before uh, the beginning of late gestation, that's nearly three pounds a day. So you can see the value in starting earlier in order to you know, target a lower average daily gain. And you can see here, then moving down into the borderline or, or four condition score, they would need to gain 80 pounds of calf, 80 pounds of body weight for a total of 160. So again, that average daily gain is just decreased um, based on that little bit more desirable condition of a, bar, of, a, of a borderline score. So the earlier you start, the better off you're going to be. So in addition to body condition scores, you can use a manure consistency to evaluate the protein status of your cows on forage-based diets. And this is um, based on some uh, resources out of SDSU Extension. Um, did a nice job of taking some pictures of some different manure patties here to take a look at. If you start over on the left-hand side, uh, this would be a cow that's deficient in protein, probably less than that 5% which is definitely not adequate for cows at any stage of production. Um, don't want to be any less than about a 7% in order to make sure that the microbes in the rumen have adequate protein to reproduce. Um, so if you're looking at this patty, you're gonna see those distinct rings. Um, it's, it's really firm. It's often stacked into a really tall pile and we're definitely gonna need a protein supplement in order to uh, make sure that cow is um, performing to her maximum. Um, looking at the picture in the middle, you got adequate protein in the sample, probably around somewhere between seven and nine percent. Folds are a little more flattened. A lot of times you'll see that greater um, look in the middle of the manure patty. Um, and depending on the stage of production, you still may need a supplement. And so if, if that's for a lactating cow, still could be slightly deficient. And so might need to just, you know, you combine the manure consistency with the, the body condition score of the cow and, and just some other indica indicators, the eye of the master, just keeping an eye on, on what those cows are doing. Finally, the, the picture on the far right, we've got excess protein, not a lot of structure here, probably greater than 10% protein, um, and we're not going to need a supplement probably in any situation here. So again, this is just something you could do, walk out on the feed grounds, um, take a look at some of the different manure piles around and see kind of as a whole, what your cows are looking like, and then use that in conjunction with, like I said, condition scores and other factors. So this was a graph that I thought was kind of interesting, published by the Noble Research Institute this fall. And this is just an average of native range crude protein um, content, which is reflected by the green bars, and then TDN or energy content reflected by the blue, blue bars. Um, with the cow requirements um, represented by the gray lines. And so if we're out here in November and December, um, you can see that the energy requirements are met typically by native range. And again, this will vary somewhat depending on your production situation. I think that 55% TDN might be a little bit high for some of our native range forages, but probably in that 45 to 50 um, percent, which would likely still meet um, those requirements at this stage of the year. But you can see that protein is going to be slightly deficient in the November and December timeframe. And so um, cows would benefit from a high protein, um, lower energy supplement during this timeframe. And then as you get into January, February, and March, you can see that 
the, the energy has continued to decline as far as what's available in the forage. Cow requirements are going up. This is looking like around a, a March calving um, cow herd just based on when you see those, those requirements peak. And so in addition to um, energy deficiency, we've also got a protein deficiency. And so kind of the point that the author was making is in this article was that um, you can maybe change supplements um, throughout the winter feeding season to be strategic depending on you know, what the deficiency is that you're trying to meet. And while it's valuable to have this type of general information, obviously having a specific sample for your forages is gonna be the most valuable. So I've talked to a lot of extension agents around the state the last couple of weeks and they're saying that there sure seems to still be a lot of pears out on pasture and that's not surprising just given kind of the open fall that we've had and good weather conditions and if you've got the forage um, that usually is a pretty good strategy but it's just important to really take a good hard look at um, you know what that forage availability is what's going to be the impact on that um, forage resource, and then what other resources do you have in terms of supplement um, or other alternative feeds? Um, like I just showed you, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to meet all the requirements for those lactating cows on native range um, on dormant forage. Um, in particular, heifers that still have, like I said before, requirements for growth. And so uh, there's a lot of data looking at different weaning dates and, and supplementation strategies and um, different combinations of, of those two um, management strategies. And kind of the data that I've seen out of, mostly based out of Montana and Nebraska says um, that providing supplement, a protein supplement can help as long as the cows aren't too thin already. Okay, so um, if, if we've got cows that are really thin, you may need to consider a supplement combined with just get just pulling those calves off of there and removing that lactation requirement. Um, we have a ton of opportunity across the state in terms of utilizing some, maybe some cover crops or other high quality forages, um, maybe to better meet the needs of those cows. And so um, just looking at some of those options that would still allow you to, to utilize a fall grazing opportunity, but maybe not targeting a, a native range situation. So the thing that enters into this is, of course, your calving dates um, and, and making sure that you're giving that cow time to recover um, in terms of a body condition. And so most of the time, once you remove that lactation requirement, those cows will start to turn around within a, a couple of weeks to a month um, after taking the calf off. And um, so just looking at that in terms of your weaning date compared to when that cow is going to be entering, you know, mid gestation or late or late gestation. Okay, so since most of you are highly dependent on forage for most of your diets, we just wanted to talk a little bit about how to optimize um, the forage supplies that you have on hand. So we're gonna recommend sampling by a lot of forage. So that's the same field, same species harvested in that 48 hour time period. And we really recommend you use a hay probe to do that, grab samples, um, either overrepresent or underrepresent the quality of the lot. And so it's really important to get a good representative sample so that we can um, really help develop that ration accurately. Use a certified laboratory. There's a lot of different labs out there that are all excellent at what they do. The National Forage Testing Association has a list of certified labs so we recommend just go to that website and you can find the labs that are certified um, in a list or if you need assistance with that just let me know and I'd be happy to help you out. Um, conducting a hay inventory, making sure you know uh, what weights of bales you're dealing with, obviously the count, and then matching up um, each of those lots with their forage quality. Then we're gonna go back to that livestock inventory based on age, weight, um, and the production class, and then try and match that hay quality up with requirements. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next few slides. So there's uh, some data here by a Hibbert and Thrift, and they kind of established some guidelines for what free choice hay intake would be based on energy content of the forage with, um, kind of the idea being that 
um, with lower quality forages that have a lower energy content. You know, these are going to be our dry winter forages, mature hay. Um, they're going to have a lot more um, indigestible components and and less of those really soluble um, energy and protein components. And so um, there's just basically a physical fill limitation with some of these lower quality forages. And so um, forage dry matter intake as a percent of body weight, as you can see, is the lowest for a dry cow with low quality forage at less than 2% of body weight. And then as we move up into medium quality and then high quality forages, um, those cows can increase consumption um, just based on higher energy levels, higher digestibility. So just have an example down here at the bottom, lactating cows can consume um, 30, around 31 pounds of a low quality forage. Um, that's based on that 2.2% of body weight for a lactating cow or they can consume 37.8 pounds of the high quality forage at 2.7% of body weight. Um, and this does consume, this does assume that protein requirements are met either by the forage itself or by supplementation. And so if protein requirements are not met, um, that intake will not be allowed to be expressed um, to this degree. So these are just some guidelines um, Again, trying to just match up your hay quality uh, with different production stages and classes. So looking at um, a gestating cow um, in mid-gestation, those requirements are lowest as we talked about earlier. This is just a different way of, of showing the requirements. As we move into late gestation, they go up. And so down at the bottom, I just have some rules of thumb that are pretty common out there. Um, and you can use 50, 55, and 60 TDN for mid, late, um, and then lactation. And then looking at protein requirements, these do vary a little bit, but we kind of use a rule of thumb of eight, nine, and 10 for mid gestation, late gestation, lactation. So this is, again, just a ballpark and a place to start. You, the, the cow doesn't require percentages of nutrients, they require pounds. And so it's gonna be um, a little bit variable just depending on your individual nutrient analysis, but it is a good place to start to figure out where you might be short of, um, maybe some higher quality forages or how you can use those most effectively. So in this example here, it's just showing the value of feeding by age group if that's possible. Um, we're feeding a 56% TDN, 8% crude protein hay. That's a decent quality hay. Um, if you look across here in the mature cow requirements, it's gonna exceed TDN requirements and slightly exceed crude protein requirements. Um, but if we look down at the yearling heifer where we're trying to get a little bit of gain or the bread heifer where we're also trying to get some gain, it's just gonna be um, really challenging to meet those requirements with that same type of forage um, and managing all of those different production groups the same. And so just with those, um, you know, still growing animals that have, you know, limited rumen capacity, limited um, places to store that much forage, uh, it's really important to try to maybe meet those needs with a more energy and protein dense diet, um, maybe some different types of supplements or just higher quality forages. So choosing the right type of supplement is really important and there are a lot of options out there, particularly in North Dakota, which we're very fortunate to have. Um, so we do categorize supplements by protein and you know, into protein and energy um, classifications, but um, we see here some examples of some common protein supplements. And of course we also have commercial options. Um, and then our energy supplements um, over here on the, the right hand side. And then we also have some co-product feeds um, and some forages of course that will kind of fall into both the protein and energy um, classification depending on, you know, what need you're trying to meet. So just your strategy in using some of these supplements with different forages. Uh, most of the time, if we have that less than 7% protein, which I mentioned is the absolute bare minimum we need to make sure those rumen microbes are performing effectively, we're gonna need some type of a protein supplement. So that's gonna be greater than or equal to a 20% protein. I gave you some examples in that previous slide. Um, and the amazing thing about beef cattle is that they can take the nitrogen from crude protein and recycle that through their bloodstream and saliva 
and that will go back to the rumen and can be used as a protein source for rumen microbes. And so that allows us to feed protein supplements fairly infrequently. Um, some research indicates up to just one time a week. Um, and so really reducing your labor and travel requirements and things like that. So if, the, if a protein deficiency is kind of what you're facing, there's a lot of options um, in terms of different types of supplements and how often you have to feed them. If our protein is adequate and we've got a better quality forage, may need to look at an energy supplement. Um, in general, just because of the nature of energy supplements, we're gonna need to feed that on a daily basis. And so it's also important to look at um, the different types of energy supplements and how they supply their energy. So some of our co-product feeds, soy hulls, wheat mids, distillers, um, those supply energy through fiber versus our, our feed grains that supply energy through starch. And so you've probably um, heard kind of the rule of thumb when we start to um, supply starch at greater than 0.4% of body weight of the cows, it can have some negative impacts on digestibility and forage intake. Now, um, I know in some drought situations, such as the one that we experienced in um, 17, I was working with some producers that actually wanted to use some of those starch containing supplements to help substitute for forage. They were actually using this negative associative effect to reduce forage intake out on range. And obviously the ability to do that will depend on um, the condition of your range. And um, many times we recommend actually just getting them out of there and putting them on a completely different diet if possible, just to reduce those um, possible impacts on range health. Do you get a few questions about non-protein nitrogen? So these would be things like urea and biurette, a lot of times used in our liquid supplements or tubs, um, sometimes in cubes, and you'll see um, urea as a, as a percent of the crude protein supplied. Um, so it is definitely usable um, by the rumen microbes. We just have to be careful at the levels that we're using that. Um, so basically, the urea, once it enters the rumen, it's converted to ammonia, okay? And the, that ammonia is used by the bacteria along with an energy source, and that produces additional proteins. Um, if that energy is deficient, then that ammonia can enter the bloodstream. And so if we end up with um, a huge load of ammonia in the bloodstream, um, it just basically kind of overwhelms the system's ability to deal with that. Um, and cattle can suffer from ammonia toxicity or urea poisoning. Um, so we can end up with toxicity issues or just performance issues. Um, just have to really watch how we're using it with those forage-based diets. So uh, one rule of thumb is um, no more than 15% of the total crude protein in the diet. So if we're supplying 8% crude protein, no more than 15% of that 8% should be supplied by urea. And really it does work best um, when we're dealing with our high energy grain-based type diets. So in a backgrounding situation or something like that. And again, just another kind of rule of thumb here for using that. So everything will come down to cost eventually. Um, this is just an example of a feed cost calculator that I worked, um, helped develop with the North Dakota Farm Business Management folks. This is a really simple one. Um, it does include transportation costs, which are important to um, figure in when you are trying to compare different feed options. Um, so you can plug in um, your bale weight, um, your pounds per ton or your tons per load, um, what the trucking costs are, how many miles it has to go, and you'll end up with a total cost per ton. We then go down here, enter in the nutrient content and the, and the values of those different um, feed resources and get to dollars per pound of nutrient, which is which is where we want to be when we're really looking at comparing those different options. And you can see um, that some of the cells are different colors. And so in this situation with between hay and wheat mids, uh, wheat mids is a better buy in terms of dollars per pound of energy. It's also a better buy in terms of dollars per pound of crude protein. And so it'll give you a green, yellow, or red um, color in the cell, depending on how things are shaking out there and comparing those. And it has lots of room for, for different feed options. That's just kind of a quick and dirty one. Um, University of Nebraska also has the feed cost calculator that um, has a lot of additional inputs that you can put in if, if you 
you know, have the desire to do that. It will um, include a, a category for waste. So you can really calculate your feed needs based on your different production groups. Um, so it just has a lot more options and that's available on the UNL website. Need to quickly mention vitamins and minerals, although energy and protein are the ones that we think about the most. Uh, it's really important to remember that our forage-based diets are likely not going to supply all of our vitamin and mineral requirements. And while we might not see a lot of, of outright um, repercussions in terms of you know, reproductive performance or, or calf weight or things like that, um, a lot of times it's just sort of a general slipping in some of these things over time um, if those needs aren't met. So these are, these are some common situations that we encounter here in North Dakota. And we do have a mineral program that focuses on um, a lot of forage analysis I'm working with individual producers to conduct the mineral analysis of the forages that they're working with throughout the production year um, to try and identify what some of these deficiencies might be and also identify potential antagonists such as sulfur and iron that can really tie up um, some of our trace minerals like copper and zinc. So there's obviously a lot of different um, supplement options out there, a lot of ways to deliver them. Um, just really important that you have a mineral in front of the cows, um, particularly prior to calving, um, because most of those uh, trace minerals are not transferred through the milk. And so um, as we get into late gestation, those developing fetuses are gonna be really dependent on that dam's ability to um, start to build up the calf's own stores of those minerals. So vitamin A is uh, one of the vitamins that we really wanna think about and make sure that we're supplying. Um, I know, again, back in that uh, really bad drought in 17, we had a lot of vitamin A deficiencies across the state and it basically was kind of manifesting as just calves that were failing to thrive. Uh, and there were a lot of calves being treated and not responding to treatment. And so vets were doing a lot of serum analysis and identifying that we had some major vitamin A challenges. Um, under good growing conditions, cows can store three to four months of vitamin A, um, but when we get in that drought situation, poor quality forages, that ability is really limited. And so they could actually be deficient at, at this time point right now um, versus being able to kind of get through the major, you know, those early winter months, January and February. So these are some of the symptoms you might see related to a vitamin A deficiency. Um, most of the time, those needs are met adequately if we have a good oral mineral supplement supplied. There is also an injectable vitamin A. Um, there are some possible side effects, um, just injection site challenges and things like that. So definitely talk to your vet about their recommendations. Um, but it is an option if, if you haven't been able to get vitamin A into them orally, would definitely consider um, doing that injection. So talk a little bit about cold weather management. Um, this is just a chart that shows um, the thermal neutral zone is that uh, temperature range where cows perform really well um, with no additional output of energy. And so looking at the left-hand side, LCT are lower critical temperature. Um, so we kind of think of that the 32 degrees or freezing um, is, is kind of our, the value that we normally use in North Dakota. Um, we can go a little bit lower just because cows are tougher here because they're really adapted to this cold environment. But you can see as it gets colder, the maintenance requirement will go up and the energy re required for production will be decreased um, even though feed intake is, is also increasing. And so we have to provide additional dietary energy to meet these um, requirements so that they can generate heat and keep themselves warm without losing condition. So this is just basically what happens when we get past that lower critical temperature. The metabolic rates are going to increase, um, again, in order just to increase that heat production and maintain, maintain temperature. That's gonna increase the need for energy. So their appetite's gonna be stimulated. Um, that increased metabolism is going to increase the passage rate and decrease nutrient utilization of those various nutrients. So, um, if we have poor quality forages, um, because of the high passage rate and decreased nutrient utilization, it's really almost impossible for them to get anything out of those lower quality forages. 
And so that's when we start to maybe think about things like um, impaction. And so basically what happens is that, that the passage rate's gonna decrease, like I mentioned, the rumen's gonna stay full of undigested material, and they're just not gonna be able to physically consume enough um, of those low quality forages to meet requirements. And so um, basically they call it starving to death with a full belly. The other problem that you run into is of course, when this happens, water intake will also decrease and, and really um, the flow through that digestive tract is almost eliminated. And so um, you'll see you know, maybe a distended abdomen, weakness, anorexia, um, and, and those animals will likely die soon if that, if that situation is not corrected. So a couple ways to manage in cold weather, um, provide higher quality forages during those times. Um, that's the ideal. Um, forages have a better, uh, hint, better heat increment, so it helps keep cattle warmer, but we can get into situations where we just can't physically um, provide them with enough forage, so we might need to think about using more of an energy-dense feedstuff. Um, separating out those thin and young cows that may be um, less able to withstand the effects of, of that cold weather can be a good idea. Um, reducing their maintenance requirements by providing some type of windbreaks or shelter um, or bedding um, that, that will really help reduce the amount of additional feed inputs you have to put out there. And then feeding in late afternoon or evening, um, that's just a strategy that helps generate um, more heat of fermentation in the coldest part of the evening when it's the most valuable for them. So beef cattle actually experience the, a wind chill. And so this is just a chart that shows you the actual um, temperature and then the wind speed and what, and what the equivalent temperatures the cattle are experiencing. So as you can see, if we go across the top, the actual temperature, you find zero. Um, if the winds are calm, then the cattle are experiencing a zero degree temperature. If we end up with a 20 mile per hour wind, which is not uncommon in most parts of North Dakota, um, if you go down to 20 miles per hour, um, you can see that they're actually experiencing an effective temperature of minus 39. So just an example here, kind of a, another rule of thumb, I really like to throw those rules of thumb out there, uh, increasing TDN by 1% for every degree below the lower critical temperature. So again, just based on that um, wind chill index of the minus 39, you would take 18, which is our lower critical temperature, minus the minus 39, and they need 57% more energy, which is a substantial amount of energy, right? Um, so here's just an example, based on the current TDN requirements, take it times the 1.57, work that through, we're gonna end up feeding around 3.6% of body weight, which is very doable, um, particularly in cold temperatures. As I said, passage rates will increase and um, intake will increase but you can get to a point in those extremely cold temperatures where again, you may not be able to meet these additional requirements with forage. So it's really important we know what the energy density of our forage is so that we can evaluate that. So the last couple of slides I just wanted to mention, uh, although most of the time we're focused on the cow, it's really important to remember that the cow is never eating for herself. She's always either pregnant nursing or pregnant and nursing. And if she's not doing those things, she's probably on a trailer headed to town. So we are starting to look more and more um, as an industry about the effects of maternal nutrition on um, the health and performance of the offspring um, based on what they experience during gestation. So muscle and fat are two obviously very economically important tissues that can be impacted by maternal nutrition. And this is just a timeline um, that represents muscle um, fiber and fat cell development. So if you look at mid gestation, that's when the majority of muscle fibers are developing. That's based, that secondary muscle fiber development is based on a scaffolding of primary muscle fibers that start to develop very early after conception. And so if we experience a nutrient deficiency in the dams during mid gestation, researchers have reported decreases in muscle fiber number and also muscle mass. And so looking out into late gestation, that's when we have a lot of muscle fiber growth. And so a restriction at that time point can reduce that muscle growth and possibly impact birth weight. Although many times in beef cattle, we don't actually see a reduction in birth weight um, and we just might 
see that the calf is not is not growing to its full potential or not growing as much as its herd mate. Um, you can also see that fat development really starts to tick up there in that in that last trimester prior to birth, and so there can be impacts on fat cell development and marbling depots in that fetal tissue. So it's kind of interesting just to think about. Um, important to note that beef cattle are born with all the muscle um, fibers that the muscle cells that they'll ever have. And so the only way that they get bigger is through growth. And so anything that might potentially impact that muscle fiber number um, is really something that can be really devastating to production um, of that offspring throughout its life. So as I mentioned, the, the fat stores develop late in gestation. That does include brown adipose tissue or BAT. Um, and, and brown adipose tissue and colostrum are both really important for providing that passive immunity to the calf, which is born with essentially no immune system. Um, it does have an immune system, but it's, it's not function and functional until after birth. And so um, that brown adipose tissue really helps the calf um, thermoregulate, um, especially in really cold temperatures, which we obviously have. It also supports immunity by providing um, a source of fuel for the organs that are very important for immune function. I know Lisa talked a little bit about the effect of diet on the immunoglobulin content and the colostrum that can be affected by all these different factors here. But again, very important for immunity. And this next slide is gonna show you some different um, responses that researchers have seen when um, dams are restricted during that last um, 100 days or, or last trimester of gestation or even um, just that last month or so. And in the interest of time, I won't go through all the details of these studies, but you can really see um, the different health consequences, increased neonatal mortality, increased scours, um, increased death loss. Um, you know, it, it appears that there's definitely an impact on the immune system and the ability of those animals to fight some of these diseases such as BRD or even, you know, respond to the vaccine. And so these are all based on um, just really not meeting the energy requirements of the cow in late gestation. So again, just some additional impacts beyond the cow herself. So I guess in just terms of take home messages, um, make sure you're get, getting a good inventory of the feeds and forages that you have available, getting all those analyzed so that we can do a better job of balancing, you know, a targeted ration for you, um, evaluating your body condition, really paying attention to those first calf heifers, maybe some thin cows, and making sure you're monitoring throughout the winter. Um, the body condition is really only a, a, a point in time reflection, and it's really a reflection of management the last several months. And so we need to keep an eye on that to keep from, from slipping as we, again, get closer and closer to calving. Sorting by needs, if possible, matching up your forage resources, um, balancing your supplements to minimize costs, and then, of course, don't forget about increasing in cold weather. A couple resources that are um, maybe of interest on our extension website, um, preparing for calving season, and then some alternative feeding strategies such as bale grazing. We've got some information on that. Um, if you're interested in those, you can just Google those. And there's my contact information, cell phone and email. If you have any questions or want to follow up on anything, I'd be more than happy to visit with you. And I will turn it back over to you, Travis. Thank you, Dr. Block. A, gr a great amount of uh, information so that I can decide of, uh, of whether my uh, system can sustain the ranch and hopefully our, uh, our team that have joined us as well um, for our participants. So thank you. Um, at this point, we uh, do not have a particular group of, of questions uh, waiting for you. And in the interest of time, uh, we're going to keep those motoring. And so just a quick reminder uh, to those that have joined us, of so the participants, um, to put your questions in the, uh, the, the, the chat or the Q&A box um, for us uh, to, to manage. And we will get those presented as we move through them. Uh, again, we have the opportunity to be joined uh, by Dr. Miranda Meehan who serves as our Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist, and Dr. Kevin Sedevic, our Rangeland Management Specialist, and also our Interim Director at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. And so uh, we appreciate their assistance. 
uh, if I'm correct, this will be, um, see, great entertainment, Miranda. Um, I remember just a quick story in our transition is that uh, my fa or my grandfather is 92. My grandfather is 92 years old. And for entertainment excitement, they got dressed up and, uh, you know, would go out on a Saturday night uh, for, uh, for dancing. And now for entertainment, Dr. Kevin Sedovic is going to come in and out of uh, uh, the background. And, uh, you know, we're just excited uh, people that, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, now not only do you not have to put your dress clothes on, we just hope that people came fully clothed uh, to our, our participants uh, for our webinar. So, Dr. Sedovic, uh, tag your it. Well, thank you very much, Travis, and it is a pleasure to be here today. As Travis said, Dr. Meehan and myself will be tag teaming this presentation. So one will come, one will go. It's up to you to see who's Kevin and who's Miranda. Um, Today is actually my daughter's 21st birthday. And so I got a chance to go out to supper with her tonight at some great restaurant downtown and to give her her first drink. Well, in reality, it's her 1,000th and first drink is my gut feeling, um, but that's beside the point. So, <laughs> so we got a chance to go out for, for that. And we came in here for this webinar. And I do appreciate you coming in today and this evening to, to, to have an opportunity to listen to Dr. Block and Dr. Meehan and myself. The topic that Miranda and I picked today is grazing management for increased ranch resilience. And in reality, when we look at resiliency in our grasslands, good grazing management and proper health really creates a resilient grassland that takes away the highs and takes away the lows. Um, and so if you can do a management strategy, even during times of drought, we can keep those pastures functioning properly. Uh, and so we, could, we don't lose that production potential. Um, our biggest issue on resiliency tends to be production because production drives carrying capacity and stocking rate. And so for producers, that is probably the biggest thing that they see is this loss of feed base for those, for those animals. And so we'll kind of cover these different strategies. We talk about uh, grazing management and resiliency across, across this presentation. All right, so we're gonna start out with uh, the, the reality, not all grasses have been created equally. And when you look at our, our grasslands across the Northern Plains, including North Dakota, uh, what we wanna see is a diverse plant community um, for our grazing animals. And so some grasses tend to be more productive, some grasses tend to be less productive. Some grasses tend to be higher in quality and others do not. And if, you're miss, if you are the poor person who has a poor quality grass, in a monoculture in your pasture, that's, that's what you have for resource and you have to deal with that and know how to manage those properly. What we obviously look for is, is, a, is a diverse plant community to, to create resiliency and, and forage across those grasslands throughout the grazing season. So we, we tend to look at growth patterns when these grasses peak, when they grow, uh, the more diverse you have in terms of when they peak and then they peak longer into the grazing season, the higher your production will be throughout that grazing period. We also look at nutritional quality. Nutritional quality obviously is a function of livestock performance and then having ample feed out in that pasture also then will impact that performance. So we're gonna, we're gonna start with, with nutritional quality this evening and look at crude protein content and energy. And Dr. Block covered some of this in her presentation as it relates to protein and energy. And what we wanna show you, um, what we wanna show you is, is basically the protein content of our grasses, which is in your left uh, figure to your left. And to your right is the, is, the, is the requirements for these lactating cows. In this graph, we have smooth brown grass, crested wheat grass, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, which is our yellow, yellow graph here. Our green grass is a, is a composition of cool season native grasses. And our blue graph is, is a combination of warm season grasses. And so obviously quality as early as it's immature. Uh, the one thing that you'll look at when you get to about mid to late June, your quality tends to run below 10% protein. And it, it obviously then it also declines throughout the season. When you have warm season grasses in your mix, they tend to retain that quality longer into the grazing season, uh, giving you a higher quality feed base late in the season. One of the flaws we have in the Dakotas and the Northern Plains is, is the invasive grasses that we tend to see more and more across our pastures. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass, our yellow bar here, and smooth brown grass, our lighter blue colored bar on the bottom. And so those grasses can really have highs and lows depending on the environmental conditions. This graph's a little misleading and it shows 
what I would call a higher quality bluegrass in a, a more moist environment. When we get into a very dry year, like we saw in 2020, the traditional quality of Tucky bluegrass tends to run down to about two to three percent, which we saw this year in July, August, and September, and October, and November, and December uh, for this year. And so if you do have a monoculture or you're dominated by one or two species, your, resili your resiliency in terms of forage quality can be very variable across those years, if it's a wet year or a dry year. What's interesting if you look at it, and Janet talked about some of this in terms of requirements. Uh, one thing to look at is, is just looking at the requirements of a lighter cow, a 1200 pound cow, which is your blue bar, and a 1400 pound, bar, 1400 pound cow, which is your red bar. The quality tends to be higher for that 1200 pound cow, but the, the, the demand or requirements is less in terms of pounds. This is a, a cow that, that has a peak of 20 pounds of milk per day, um, which is not the norm anymore. It, it's hard to find a cow that's going to be even at 25 pounds of peak per day. And it's not uncommon to see these 30 pound peaks in our cow herds today. So if you look at a, at a 1200 pound cow, 30 pound peaks, you're looking at 12 and percent protein uh, on that within that diet for that second month of, of, of lactation. And it drops down to about 11 percent by that fourth month. So you look over here to your left bar and you you have a, a 1200 pound cow, 400 pound cow that's a high milker, you're not gonna have requirements anymore to meet that requirement by that cow by July 1 or July 15th. And so just in normal years like 2020 where we're dry, requirements just not, would not have been met in terms of protein value uh, on these cows. So just thinking about what your demand is on your cows that you have. Uh, we talked about early weaning and you can see how dramatic it changes once you wean those calves off that dam side, you're going from an 8% to 6%, much easier to meet the requirements on that cow, not only in terms of intake, but quality. So when we go to the next slide here, we're gonna look at energy, uh, energy supply that those cows, the grasses provide, and then the energy demand by those same set of cows, 1200 pound and 400 pound cows at different milking levels. The graph today on this side, the blue bar is smooth brown grass. We do have our cool season natives is that green bar, our warm seasons is yellow bar, and then that red bar is crested wheatgrass. What is nice to know is, is on the average, no matter what kind of year we have, on an average, our grasslands will achieve adequate energy for these cows, unless you're getting into these, these high demand, high milk producing cows, where you're looking at 60%. Uh, you can see we drop below 60% by about anywhere from August 1 to September 1 for some of these cows. And so, the, the really rule of thumb that I go by is, is if your grass is green and lush, um, you're probably gonna meet the requirements of those cows uh, for protein and energy. If your grass is brown, it's gotten cured out, it's mature, more than likely you're not meeting the requirements in terms of protein or energy. 2020, we, we already reached those stages of development by about early to mid July. And so a lot of our performance would have been seen particularly on that female side uh, because of the drought conditions that we experienced in 2020. We're going to swap off to Dr. Meehan. So in addition to knowing what grasses you have, it's really important to know what you have for forage production so you can set that baseline and determine um, that forage supply versus that forage demand of that animal that you're grazing. Um, when we in the world of grazing management, when we talk about forage supply, we talk, we're talking about carrying capacity of that pasture, um, which is a calculation based off of the amount of grass that's produced, but how much of that grass is available for, your, for consumption by, by livestock. As we know, some of it's wasted, um, and we also want to know, leave some behind to ensure that that rangeland stays healthy or that pasture stays healthy. Um, so carrying capacity is defined as the maximum stocking rate possible that maintains and improves vegetation and rangeland resources. Um, and it's really critical that we understand what our carrying capacity is to effectively manage our grazing resources. Um, it's going to fluctuate. We all know that um, in 2020, our carrying capacity was lower because of the drought we experienced, our 2017. And when we have a wet year, it could be a little higher, but it gives you it gives you a baseline for making those management decisions when you do go through a year like that. 
Um, so if you need assistance um, calculate, making those calculations, contact your local extension agent, um, contact your NRC at local NRCS office for assistance, or Kevin or myself will be more than happy to come out and help you go through that process. The other side of that is that forged demand side, which we refer to as stocking rate. Um, stocking rates defined as a number of specific kind and class of animals that are grazing in an area for a specific period of time. And stocking rate really is the most important management decision we make in, a rain, in our grazing systems. And ideally, I was going to have a poll here, um, but if you want to put in the chat box, it is... Um, I was curious as to when is the last time those of you that have livestock have assessed or adjusted your stocking rate? Oh, and maybe you guys can't put stuff in the chat. Never mind. We'll move on and ask at the end. So when we talk about stocking rate, um, it's really important, as Kevin alluded to, those, those animals have different demands depending at what stage of production they're in um, and their size. And so when we talk about an animal unit month, which is what we express stocking rates in, that's the amount of forage livestock will consume in a one month period of time. And that's the standard that we often refer, refer to. So that one AUM is based off of the requirements of a one 1,000 pound cow with a six month or younger calf by our side. Um, and so if you had, here we have that 1,000 pound cow with calf at one, um, and, and that's what we call that an animal union equivalent. And then if you had a 1,400 pound cow with a calf, it'd be 1.29. Or if you had sheep, for instance, it would be 0 0.2. So what the type of animal, the type of livestock you're grazing in the stage of production is really gonna impact the requirements, which Dana discussed in depth with us. And so as we calculate our stocking rate, we're gonna look at that number of animals we have, um, take that times that animal unit equivalent, and that gives you the number of animal units you're grazing, and then the, the number of months you're grazing, and that gives you your AUMs or your stocking rate. You can also express this as, as grazing days or animal unit days, um, however you prefer to calculate it, but it gives you an estimate as to where you are and then you can compare that to what you have for available forage. Now, as we look at trends in the beef industry, um, if you haven't, if you're not adjusting your stocking rate or reviewing it, um, an example from in 1975, the average US beef cow weighed just over a thousand pounds. Um, compared to 2009, where we're closer to that 1,400 pounds. And so if you just were using a historic stocking rate for a pasture and you had 150 cows and you graze for a four month period, so from June to October, you would have six, would have been grazing 600 animal unit months in 1975. However, in 2009, you would be grazing 774 animal unit months. So that's an additional 174 animal unit months that you're grazing. And so it's really important that as we make changes to our herd and the genetics in our animals, we're adjusting our stocking rates to, to reflect that um, because we know that average cow size has increased. However, forage production has not increased on our rangelands. Um, I mean, we have, there's ways we can increase it a little bit um, through good management but overall, it's, it's a fairly consistent thing. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Kevin to talk about what we need to consider looking into 2021. Hello again. So I assume it's no secret to most of you that 2020 was, was, probably, one of, was a, probably one of our severe drought years, at least during the summer and fall period, we, we, many of us experienced drought conditions or dry conditions. And this just shows you the US drought monitor for North Dakota uh, on November 17th. And you can see about 40% of our state was in a D2 drought um, and almost 90% of our state was in some type of a drought condition. Um, what's, what's probably more worried to me is that this drought has gotten worse throughout the fall 
Um, if you go back to August and through September and October, November, um, that D2 has actually expanded. And I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised that parts of the state are not in a D3, especially the far Northwest part of the state. And so we're looking at going into the fall and, and next spring with very dry conditions uh, that, that most of our producers are gonna have to deal with. And I, I took the end on station maps and grabbed a few locations to give you a feel for where we were at in terms of departures from normal for the 2020 uh, growing season. And if you if you look at, at probably our driest area was in Northwest at a 41% of normal uh, uh, precip in that region. Uh, most, most of this area sat around the 50 to 60% of normal. Because you get a little farther east, you see 75% by the Devil's Lake area. You get up into Cavalier County or Pembina County, uh, you're 84%. The only part of the state that was not dry, and you can see here, this is where we're actually by, by Edgeley, uh, we're at, or Allendale actually, we're at 95%, 89% by Wapaton. And the Southwest, not quite as bad as, this, as the central part of the Coteau region. And so you can see, we, we, we could have kind of suffered this drop condition. I think it actually, these numbers actually look worse as you look into the fall period. And uh, if, if there's anybody on here from other parts of the country, we actually aren't suffering as bad as other parts of the country. As you can see, uh, you get into Wyoming and Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, they're in extremely severe drought into these D3, D4 levels. And so in terms of you just think about the cattle markets and the supply of feed out in the country right now, uh, this is gonna have some kind of impact on, on available feed for this spring in particular uh, in these areas where we have a lot of cattle. So what it is I wanted to look at, what, what happened different in 2020 uh, compared to 2019 in terms of fall moisture? And, and really a lot of producers really didn't suffer in 2020 due to drought until we really got into the months of late July and into August. And the reason for that was because of subsoil moisture that we received in, 20, in 2019 in that fall period. So I took, I took four locations and looked at precipitation in August, September, and October of 2019 which is the red bar. And then that same time period in 2020. So I have Streeter, Williston, Bowman, and Minot. And last fall, we ranged from 168 to 287% above normal precip in the months of August, September, and October. So we had tremendous carryover in fall moisture that reached into the spring that really saved us in 2020. And it's why we really didn't see a lot of panic in terms of drought like we saw in 2017. Um, now let's look at this fall. You look at those same locations in 2020, Streeter's at 58% of normal, Williston is at 15% of normal for that time period. If you think that, that it's not dry in Williston area and it's not gonna have an impact on next year's growth, you're kidding yourself. We're gonna see some impacts in much of this region uh, because of what happened this fall. Uh, the positive thing that will happen is you probably will not see a sweet clover bloom in Western North Dakota because of these dry conditions. So if you look at, at predicting forage production, we tell producers we can do a really good job of predicting um, production uh, parameters early in the growing season in North Dakota. We really grow most of our forage production based on precipitation from April to June. If you're in Eastern Montana and Eastern Wyoming, you're looking at April, May as your critical months of precipitation. In the Dakotas, you're looking at May and June. If you tend to be heavy in warm seasons, grasses, which most of us are not, you're looking at June and July. And so you can predict really well and really quick on if you're gonna have a good year or bad year based on, on precipitation in the months of May and June in North Dakota. So this graph shows you growth curves. So this is Western wheatgrass, which is your typical growth curve of a cool season grass. The green bar is a warm season grass. So this example, it's blue grama grass. And for those who live in the Coteau region where we're dominated by bluegrass, this is Kentucky bluegrass. So you can see in that period from, from mid-May or early May to July 1, roughly 90% of our, of our cool season grasses have produced that biomass for that given year. And it's about 80% of its overall growth occurs in that time period, depending on fall moisture. Your warm season grass, it's about 45 to 50%. If you're, if you're dominated by bluegrass or brograss, you're looking at about 85, 95 to 100% of its growth occurring by July 1. So if you do not receive precipitation during this time period, you'd better be planning on a lower producing year, unless your pastures are in phenomenal condition, great soil water holding capacity, uh, where, you can, where you can be resilient in one year. Producers should plan 
uh, fairly early in the game if you look at dry conditions carry over next spring. There's also been a, a calculator that was developed. It's called a forward prediction calculator that NDSU developed. I'm sure Dr. Mia must took the lead in this. And so if you get a chance, and I've actually worked on this data, it allows you to, uh, to look at predictions of, of potential to get rainfall to achieve the requirements you need to produce normal forward production. So if you get a chance to, to click on this link, it allows you to at least look at calculating your probability of getting adequate rainfall to grow normal, pre, normal growth for that given year. So I want to end up end up with my session here on, on looking at 2021 in terms of drought strategies. And so you're going to look at different scenarios and one that we may come into. And if we, the nice thing about this falls, it's been great, great weather, low precip, no snow. Um, it's been great for us, but not so not so good for our resources. So if you look at going in the next spring with a below normal precipitation levels and moisture, you know, I would tell producers to expect severe, severe reductions in terms of forage production. You're coming into a dry fall, you have no subsoil, you don't get any spring moisture. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if forage production levels are 50% or, or less uh, if we have a dry spring next year. And if those drought conditions continue into the summer months, you will also expect to see a reduction in terms of forage quality. If we come into next year with a normal spring moisture, and you can, you can kind of get my feel where I'm going with this, uh, because we're so dry this fall, even if we get normal spring moisture, I expect most of our producers, unless their pastures are in really good range health, uh, they're going to have a reduction in forage production in 2021. Um, it, it could be anywhere from 20% to 50%, depending on how they impacted their grazing strategies in the fall of 2020. If they come into the fall period, those pastures are overgrazed, that bottom leaf that becomes your next spring's growth has been removed. Uh, you're not going to get a delay in terms of forage production, but you're also going to lose a amount of biomass potential, potential because of those dry conditions. And again, forage quality will also be impacted if those drought conditions uh, continue on into the summer months. So let's look at a wet spring. Let's say we get lucky next spring and, and we get some good moisture. Um, because we're so stressed this year, this would be the best case scenario, but I would not expect us to produce above normal, pre normal forage production even with the wet spring because of the dry conditions we're experiencing in 2020. Um, unless your pastures are in really good condition, and that's where resiliency plays a role in terms of good management, those pastures will actually experience above normal production uh, in the wet spring because those pastures have been kept in good shape and have been managed to, to achieve diversity across those pastures uh, to, to maintain production in these wet periods. Hopefully we do have a good wet spring next year, and so we have the opportunity at least to grow normal production at worst. And so I'm gonna turn, turn the program back over to, to, to Miranda to kind of finish up our portion of this presentation. I'm gonna wrap things up with just a discussion of some of the management considerations and what we can do to help reduce the impacts of this fall drought and hopefully not have to go through another drought, but considerations for that as well. So the first thing is that timing of grazing this spring is going to be extremely important. Um, that turnout date, we want to be making sure we're not turning our cows out. And I preach this all the time, but before our grasses reach that grazing readiness stage. Um, and the reason for this is we, we want to make sure that we're reducing that amount of bare ground and increasing litter cover. And that's going to help maintain what soil moisture there is and reduce evaporation. Also, it's gonna help increase our plant vigor. And if we do graze too early, so what happens is we're gonna reduce that plant area, leaf area. And when we reduce that plant leaf area, it reduces the plant's ability to conduct photosynthesis, and which is required to replace the carbohydrates that are depleted during the winter and during the green up periods. And so when this happens, it re reduces that plant's vigor and our plant, we see thin stands, we'll see a reduction in total forage production. And in turn, we'll also see increases in disease, um, potential insect infestations and weed infestations in those pastures. Um, when, we do, when we graze too early, um, we have the potential to reduce forage production by as much as 60% during the grazing season. And this is gonna reduce, again, our carrying capacity, which decreases stocking rates. And if we don't decrease those stocking rates or adjust them, we're gonna, we could see a result in animal performance as well. 
And so what does grazing readiness look like? It's pretty simple to go out there um, and look at plant development and determine if your pastures are ready to be grazed. Um, so when we look at our domestic pastures or planted species such as our bromes and our crested wheatgrass, it's a three leaf stage. So we just count those leaves that are fully emerged, one, two, and three. And then we look at our native rangelands, we're looking at the three and a half leaf stage. And so we have a half, this leaf isn't fully emerged yet. And so that would be a half a leaf there. Um, considerations, it goes back to Kevin's discussion of knowing what species you have out there. Um, when we're looking at those species, our different species re reach grazing readiness at different points in time. So as we're looking at our grazing strategies and where can we start or, and have the, we reduce the impact to those grasses potentially. Um, crested wheatgrass is typically ready to graze early May, our bromes mid-May, and then we move into post-contract CRP lands. A lot of those in North Dakota tend to be our intermediate and tall wheatgrasses and uh, reach grazing readiness in late May. And then our native cool season species reach, reach grazing readiness in early June, as Kevin discussed. Uh, However, we know that if those pastures receive a little extra grazing pressure this summer or fall because of drought conditions, we may see a delay in plant development. Um, and this is an example from 2017 and 18 from Oliver County. And in Oliver County, Western wheatgrass was ready to graze um, on May 9th and at that three and a half leaf stage. However, with our drought in 17, that pasture got grazed a little heavy and we've seen a delay in plant development in, in 2018 in which this plant wasn't even at, it was only at the one and a half leaf stage on May 14th. So a fairly significant delay in development. So some recommendations to optimize our range performance as we head into 2021 and in the future is really that first and most important is turn out to pasture when they're ready to be grazed. Um, so that might not be something that you can do in all situations, every ranch is different. Um, so there are a few ways that we can reduce that impact. Um, one of those is spring graze our domesticated or introduced species. So crested wheatgrass, smooth brome grass pastures are those that are heavily infested by Kentucky bluegrass and maybe you'll have a negative impact on that Kentucky bluegrass and get some more natives in there. Um, this probably isn't likely for a likely an option for a lot of you just with how dry our fall was, but if you're able to spring graze some winter grain, uh, grain crops such as our winter rye or winter triticale. Um, seed in early season spring crop, which obviously you're gonna have to assess what you have for available soil moisture in the spring before you make that investment. And again, same, same thing goes for seeding a full season cover crop and having these other options will reduce that pressure to our pasture and range lands. Another option is feed more hay. Um, and you've seen what things look like in the rest of the country. So plan now um, if you're gonna, if that's the option you think you're gonna use um, and purchase those, those hay supplies if you are in short supply. If you go through that assessment, the JANAs and determine that you need more hay, um, make those purchases ahead of time and plan for that. If you are going to feed hay and you don't wanna do it in a, in a dry lot situation, you know, look at feeding it on pasture that's domesticated. We don't wanna do that on rangeland because it, it has the potential to in, introduce um, noxious weeds are on hayland where those weeds are a little easier to control. And most, another very important thing is minimize repeated years of overgrazing. Our rangelands are very resilient. Um, they evolved with grazing as, as a disturbance, but if we continually abuse them, we are gonna see an impact. So if you did overgraze a pasture in 2020, and make sure that you don't start grazing in that pasture this year. Let it recover before you, you introduce animals into it again. And most importantly, develop a drought management strategy now if you haven't already. As you heard from Kevin, 
the chances that we have a normal forage producing year are, are not high. So let's prepare for that now and it'll make the decision making process easier when we get to that point. Um, again, if that precipitation is low in May, through, well, April through June, or but specifically May through June, um, start implementing that drought plan. Use the calculator that that forage prediction calculator to see the potential for you to receive that the precipitation you need in the period, and make those adjustments early. And if you need help going through the calculator, give your county agent a call. They'll help you through it. Again, those summer rains, they're gonna enhance those warm season grasses, but they're not gonna add much new growth to our cool season grasses. However, forage quality will increase. So fall, if the drought continues into fall, we're gonna see low quality feeds and plants becoming susceptible to low vigor, very similar to what we've seen this fall. Um, and two years of drought is gonna create changes in the plant community and forage production that is gonna be dramatically reduced. Um, so we're gonna, it's gonna take more than grazing management alone to address that. You're gonna be need to think about things like destocking or adding more land, which is not an option for a lot of us. So destocking um, are, adding, are looking at other more creative options for grazing. Limit your overuse to one to two pastures. Um, and so if, if you do hit a pasture really hard, you know, allow deferment for the, for the next grazing season, which is hard to do for a lot of people, but it's, it's important if you wanna keep that, maintain the long-term resilience of that pasture. Increase plant vigor again by delaying that spring turnout. We wanna do that by monitoring grazing readiness of those key species in those pastures. Most important rule of grazing management stocking rates should not be greater than carrying capacity ever. Um, if drought continues, early adjustments of a stocking rate will need to occur due to that loss of forage production. And if you need help going through those carrying capacity stocking rate numbers or calculations, we do have a grazing calculator app that you can use to assist you with those, those calculations. You just look up NDSU grazing calculator, it's a free app. Um, and your county agents are always a resource for you as well. And with that, I will turn it back over to Travis. Thank you, Dr. Meehan and Dr. Sedovic. So uh, to keep your discussion going, and, and uh, we appreciate uh, certainly the information that you went over, uh, just what's happening in my mind and, and kind of thinking through this is, I almost wonder, and I will take your perspective on this as just a quick summary, of whether we're in a perfect storm for kind of a, a negative May. And my description in that, uh, Kevin and Miranda, is that, um, that since we've had the seasonal fall uh, and Jana approached it and, you know, our extension agent said that we're grazing some of those cows. Well, we're not grazing them all on cover crops and we're not grazing them all on corn stalks. And so um, what is your thoughts relative to kind of, uh, if uh, if we're kind of doing some long term or even some short term uh, negativity to our pastures or or what your approach is, if you'd kindly address that or saying you know maybe we need to kind of save that and and uh, and and get the pasture recovering earlier. That's a great question, and we get that question a lot on uh, as it relates to winter grazing our grasslands and rangelands. So they're out right now grazing on our grasslands, but not on crop residue, they're not on cover crops. Uh, Western Dakotas, this is very common, Eastern Montana, Eastern Wyoming. Um, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with grazing late in the season in terms of impacts on plant community, as long as you do not overgraze that pasture. It's important that you need to leave that bottom tiller on your cool season grass. Your cool season grasses never stop growing. They're growing in January, they're growing in February. If you keep that bottom leaf, that next spring's leaf intact, you won't have a negative effect. On the average, you, you still want to have enough biomass there and structure to catch snow to capture moisture. So if you graze it even close enough where you're not catching that snow, that's moisture you're not going to capture. And so there's a fine line of, of yes, you can graze it. Um, the requirements are lower for that cow, so her intake is also reduced. 
but you still can't overgraze it. And it's important to, to relay that message that you can overgraze your winter pastures. Don't do it or you're gonna have an impact. I'd like to make the reminder and Miranda just put that in the chat uh, that we would like uh, you to fill out the poll and survey that we do have. Uh, we have, uh, I believe seven questions on there now. Uh, excuse me, eight questions uh, that we can talk about. But also, uh, if you have any other particular questions that you would like to uh, bring up, we would welcome those. And one of the things that I guess seems tougher, uh, this is to you, uh, Dr. Jana Block. And in fact, I, I see that, you know, your your co cattle colleague slash namesake, uh, uh, Ross, is, is on here. And luckily with uh, um, our the the technology is that uh, a little bit of the halo actually from your or the the light from the your angel halo shines on your um, head and so that's really great that uh, that that's working out nicely for you. But my quick question um, is that that we talk about saying, hey, we need to separate our young heifers and our old cows, and um, and commonly we don't have the facilities and or we're not willing to take the time, which may be part of it. Um, and so I guess what would be your selection? And I, I suppose maybe the better one is, is our younger one or where would you make that call of saying, if we were to put a remedial pen together, what would be your selection criteria to put, put them in that pen? Uh, well, um, I mean, it's really gonna, it's so variable depending on you know what what um, facilities people have and and um, how they can manage that and um, I mean we have a lot of those same challenges here on our place I mean just trying to find room for everything and trying to split things out like you should I mean I think it would really come down to just taking a really good look at at things and um, you know going through and and doing those body condition scores and picking out some of those thin cows, young cows. Um, you know, I have a lot of people that when we talk about, you know, really babying your thin cows, they say, well, if that cow can't make it on the feed resources that I'm providing for her, she probably doesn't belong on this place. So that's a consideration. There's people that don't care to baby those cows over the winter by providing additional feed. And they just, they think that, you know, maybe not if it's just one year, but if that cow is consistently thin based on the management scenario that she's in, maybe she just needs to go to town. So maybe it is an opportunity to um, do some strategic culling um, if the cows just aren't matching up with that environment. But I mean, when you've got your first calf heifers and um, that's kind of, you know, the future of your herd, it, it if at all possible, that's worthwhile to, to put a little extra effort into them, I guess, is my thought. Thank you very much. And when when we have those, um, you know, the the heifers, and we talked just a little bit, and in, initially you did there on on uh, on some of our genetic selection, and this is going back and making pulling it together as a a two part series uh, that we talked about previously last week. Is that according to our poll uh, that we have uh, for our producers right now? Is that um, sixty or fifty seven percent of our producers that responded had an increase in their average calving size and 30% of them um, had, so 30, and then 30% of them had it staying the same. Not very many people have, have had a decrease um, and, and certainly that's something. And, and I guess uh, Miranda, you touched on that of, of probably the importance of realizing that um, our, even a, a 12, 13, 1400 pound cow with calf at side uh, isn't a, a 1.0 relative to animal units. And I thought that was certainly interesting and, and something we need to keep into consideration as we move forward. Um, so it, I, I think that that's a good spot. And I appreciate uh, Jana that you're saying, well, maybe some of that on the older standpoint is that we are challenging them, uh, but we want to maintain it as well. And so uh, thank, thank you, Miranda. Do you have anything to add there? Um, just on 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 some of those cows and kind of what what's the thought process that we could potentially have uh, relative to just our, our cow maintenance uh, on the range pasture there. 
I mean, I think the most, you know, the important thing is that you're balancing what you have there for available forage and not overgrazing. Um, so because the, the, if you overgraze, those cows start competing for forage resources and there's starts, and you get to the point where they're spending more time looking for forage to eat than they are actually eating because of that overuse. And over the long run, we also see a shift and we see plant species that they're not going to eat come in. Um, things like fringe sagewort, curly cup gumweed. Uh, we see a shift to some of those shorter grasses. Why they, they're still good quality, they're not as high of pro, high producing. So we'll see a shift from, in for example, on a loamy ecological site, we're going to see, which is our dominant in North Dakota, um, we're going to see a shift from western wheatgrass dominated site more to a blue grama dominated site, which is a lot lower producing when you look at how a plant this big versus a plant that can get that big. Um, and so knowing what you have out there um, and how you manage those resources is gonna shift what you have out there. And maybe they'll disappear like me. <laughs> well, um, it's, a, it's a special talent. Uh, thank you, Miranda. And I'm gonna bring it back uh, to, uh, to, to Dr. Jana there. Um, and so that you can provide, uh, again, she talked about some of those forage resources, um, but I know that plenty of the thoughts in, in your operation and the producers that you're working with uh, is, is protein driven, uh, particularly now as we move into December. And so what are the, as we kind of close some of this up is, is, is what's your quick kind of take home in terms of um, protein supplementation? Let's say that, uh, you know, I, I have, uh, 50 head of cows uh, to keep it simple and um, those are you know currently uh, out on the, the pasture with, without probably enough protein and so what, what's your what's the quick an or your your answers for for those producers that contact you and say hey I actually don't know where my cows are at relative to uh, uh, consumption of, of crude protein right now well um we, we have done a little bit of, and I mean, Miranda and, and Kevin could probably address this even more, um, you know, trying to do some sampling of standing forage. Um, that is definitely challenging. Um, what we do in our mineral program is recommend that people kind of um, go out and observe the cows and what they're consuming and, and try to um, take a grab sample um, of those species that are being grazed and, and also making sure that you're representing just how much is being grazed. So if they're if they're just clipping the tops off, you just put the tops off. If they're taking it down to the ground, you take it down to the ground. And so trying to really um, represent what the cow's grazing, I mean, it's always kind of a guessing game. And, and the more data that we have, the, the more precise we can be. Some people aren't willing to go to those lengths. And I completely understand that. It's very time consuming and it requires a lot of commitment. So um, looking at those, um, looking at the body condition scores, understanding that this time of year, we would likely benefit from a protein supplement, particularly for the spring calving cows um, and evaluating, you know, kind of where they're hanging out, looking at the manure piles and um, just kind of seeing where things are at. And, um, you know, the, the types of supplements that you can get are, I mean, there's, there's just countless numbers of options. And so it really depends on what you have available. Um, a lot of people could use just alfalfa hay as a protein supplement um, and just do that infrequently. And so wouldn't have to be an everyday deal, um, maybe just once or twice a week, or depending on how much they need. Um, there's lots of, of fairly easy options to just improve that protein status. Um, but I think, you know, back to your point, we're always focused on protein um, there's a lot of times where we really should be providing more of an energy-based supplement. Um, I know during that drought, there were a lot of people that were feeding cake and that's a plant-based cake product. And the whole goal of a protein supplement and, and what it accomplishes is it increases forage intake and digestibility. So if they were trying to substitute for forage intake, that was probably backfiring. And so that's where they could have used more of that starch-based type supplement to offset that forage consumption. So um, there are some really good um, supplement decision tools um, that are available that you can kind of evaluate like, okay, is the brass, is the grass brown? Um, is there enough of it? Okay, 
what it, what's the body condition of the cows, and you can walk through this process. Um, it's just a supplement decision tree that would kind of give people a, an idea of, of where to go. And I can post that on our website if that would be helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Jana. And just a, a quick uh, evaluation of our, our poll as well is that uh, we asked uh, when was the last time that you evaluated your stocking rate of those that did, 50% um, of them did that last year and 50% of them uh, did it one to five years ago. I know that when we do these, hopefully we have the influencers and potentially, uh, you know, more progressive stockmen, but for all of those that are wishing to join us and watch us in the near future or able to pull us up, make sure to, uh, to realize that we, uh, I myself am surrounded by talented people here at NDSU and that we have not only uh, talented presenters that have brought you information today, uh, but we also have extension agents uh, across our uh, state in our agricultural natural resources that are willing to help you relative to carrying capacity, stocking right, and also uh, to, to develop a, a management uh, plan for you. And so, again, we've got uh, an exciting group of people, and, and they can also help us with body condition scores too, Jana, so that we can know which way we want to go there on the selection gate. And so I'm going to open it up one last time uh, if uh, our presenters have anything. Otherwise, uh, I think that uh, uh, we're, we're moving uh, towards the end of our, our event. Okay, good. Uh, with that, um, I would like to thank uh, our attendees and thank our presenters, uh, Dr. Block and Dr. Meehan and Dr. Sedovic and uh, our team at, uh, at North Dakota State University Extension uh, for helping to facilitate and provide uh, information on how you can uh, sustain uh, your ranch. And so thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you all and happy holidays, Merry Christmas and have a great new year.